Hey, this is uh, Jay Harwood's latest edition of Amazing uh, Conversations with uh, Evan Roberts, the co-host of the most popular uh, sports show in New York, uh, Craig and Evan on WFAN. It's my Don Imus invitation, by the way. <laughs> Unless my math is bad, it probably is. This is your 20th year with FAN? Yeah, pretty much. I, I did my first show in 04, and I've been doing, or I started Middays with Joe in 07, so... I'm not good at math, but I think it's about 20 years of doing shows on the fan, which is and you, nuts. And you're not even 40 years. So you, you, you started when you were nine in FAN, right? <laughs> Yeah. My first ever show on FAN was when I was nine. Then I had a long respite. But yeah, when I came back, I was in my early 20s. Tell me about your book. You know, um, I know I kept score every year since 1980. My problem is I can't read my f***ing score. Oh, my God. <laughs> my f***ing score books. How do you read your scorebooks after all these years? I, so I started scoring games. Tell the people what you're doing, by the way. Tell the people what you're doing. Okay, so I, I, I started scoring games since I was like five or six. And I think it was because my dad wanted me to sit through an entire game. And at five years old, I had no attention span. And he taught me how to score and it kept me focused on the game and really kind of taught me baseball. So I've been doing it. And then I, like, I think three years into it, I was really careful with my penmanship. Like I would write as clear as day because I knew I wanted to be able to read it. So I have a few skills in life, not many, one of which is I have very neat handwriting. So when I go back and look at a scorecard from when I was 10, I can actually read it, which is incredible. So the idea was I would love to, to publish a lot of these scorecards. I can't even read my score. I have some scorebooks from 1980, and this looks like it's Russian. I mean, I can't. I have my own equipment. <laughs> But you could really read your, your what, what's the first game you kept scored? Do you so I, I don't remember, but I found it. So I have a date. It's June of 1992 was the oldest scorecard I could find. So at that point, I guess I was eight years old. So it was a little bit later. I wasn't five. I was eight years old. It was a Mets Pirates game. And the first home run I ever scored was Barry Bonds. So I got that one right out of the way. But I don't remember that game. But literally, I have scored every significant Met game in the last 30 years. There's none I've missed. Well, I have. I mean, I, I stopped when I switched job duty, alumni job at 18. I stopped. I was really like, oh, uh, 1980, 2018, I scored practically every, every game. Isn't know? that awesome but, to have, though, to look back and see, like, all these classic games and have it right in front of you? If I could read it, it would be <laughs> great, but, 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 but I can't read it. Listen, I, don't, I got a little bit, bit of bad news for you to tell you. Um, one of my good friends is Rico Bronia, okay? <laughs> and he's not happy with you right now. Right? <laughs> I mean, I spoke to Rico last night. I told him he's still doing this, and he said, where's my residuals? <laughs> How did you come up with the Rico Bronia podcast? How did you pick that name out of the hat? So I love Rico Bronia, like genuinely. Great it's player. not mocking, it's love. So when he played for the Mets in the early 90s, or 1996, 1997, I was this 12, 13-year-old left-handed first baseman, and I couldn't hit. Not that Rico couldn't hit, but I loved his defense at first base. For my money, because I'm too young to remember Keith, so it's no knock on Keith Hernandez, but for my money, right. Rico Bronia is the greatest defensive first baseman I've ever seen. So I always loved him as a kid. And when we were launching this Met podcast, I wanted to come up with an original name, like something different. So in honor of my boss at FAN, Spike Eskin, who has a podcast about the Sixers, the 76ers, and it's named after a random player. I asked him, I said, can I borrow your idea? I'd like to name the Met podcast after a random player to most, but to me, my favorite player. Like I loved Rico. I have his jersey at home. And so it was kind of an honoring of Rico Bronia and an honoring of the New York Mets in which I named the podcast after you, the great. You know Rico what his claim to fame is? He once coached a high school basketball team. He was 0-26 in one year. I used to bust his chops all the time. He used to coach. He was a football coach and a line coach. And he never, he won like three games in like, you know, like in, in, in five years. And one thing I got to tell you, Evan, is I'm a, I like the way you stick up with Jacob DeGrom. Jacob is one of my, closest friends where I was here. I was with him for his rookie of the year and his Cy Young. And it kind of bothers me the way some people have turned on him. You know, I mean, it just kind of rankles me. And I know you stuck up for him on on, on the air. And, uh, you know, as one uh, friend, I want to I appreciate what you're doing with that. Well, I think he's been disrespected by Met fans. I, I don't know why. I mean, I think he's one of the all-time great Mets. He should have his number retired. And I think that as time goes by, anyone who's criticized him, over the last few months, they're going to come around. Like when he walks into this building, I think this year as a member of the Rangers, I think he gets a standing ovation. Yeah, I hope so. I don't I think don't. there's any issue with it, but it sucks to me he's not here. I used to have this great deal with him. You know, I'm about 40 years older than him. 
And, you know, to get Jacob to do stuff, I had to used to have this little game. Uh, for him to do an interview, we, had, we used to have this basketball net in the locker room. He would tell me, if you make three or four shots, I'll do any interviews for you. <laughs> I never made three or four shots. He always did the interview. One time I had the fun goes to him and Stephen Mack. You know, I never considered myself a suit. And that's why I used to get along with these guys a lot younger than me. Before I get to me one other favor, you got to tell Joe I not, never hated him. <laughs> Every time I hear on the radio, Jay, I never hated him. I got, I got what the gear was. We didn't play well. What it was, what it was, what it was. You know, I never, I never, I never hated him at all. I mean, I got another stupid question for you. Do you remember the first time we met at all? You know what I do remember, though? And this is maybe where I met you, and it's a completely different story. I was at a Met game when I was about 12 years old, and I hosted like a kid's talk show. Nobody listened to it, but I did a kid's show. kind of gave me experience. Yeah. And I got – two guys got in a fight at Shea Stadium and fell on me, okay? And I ended up getting stretchered off and brought to the really? hospital. This is a true story, okay? And I had to leave the game early. I didn't finish the scorecard. I was devastated. And the Mets felt bad. And they asked me and my dad and my mom, like, what can we give them? We feel bad. And I said an interview for my uh, sports show. And you hooked me up with Tim Bogart to interview. <laughs> I mean, t- tell me the difference. You were with Joe for like 07 to 2020. How long did it take you to adapt to Craig's style? Of board? I mean, did it take you a long time to do? Was it natural progression? You know, I went into it knowing, okay, this is going to be completely different. Craig is so different than Joe. The show is going to be different. The focus is going to be different. I'd say it took like a month, to be honest with you. Like the first few shows were weird getting used to it. But I think within a month, it felt very natural. And uh, it's been very, very comfortable. And I love doing both. I mean, people ask me, like, how would you compare the two? What do you like more? Completely different shows. Completely different shows, but both fun in its own way. And I've enjoyed the last two and a half years. I think he's given I mean, you know, with my, he's given you more leeway. You seem more comfortable as time goes by. I mean, you know, to be your own person, is that, is that not true or true? You know? Yeah, I think it, it, the show's allowed me to show a different side of me. I think with Joe, it was just straight up screaming about sports, you know, mad, happy, and all that. And I think with Craig, it's a little bit of that. It's a little bit of just everything else. So uh, it's definitely been able to show a different side of me, that's for sure. Do you, do you wish your father had rooted for different teams, maybe? <laughs> I mean, what do you say about you? You're not a front runner. The Jets, the Mets... The Islanders and the Knicks. Yeah. I mean, nobody can accuse you of being a front runner, right? I have no reg- – as much pain as I've had, I have no regrets because I know when someone wins a championship, if I'm on this earth to see one of those teams, and I hope we it's the Mets. We were a couple of times. Yeah. In 2000, we were there in Mets in 15. Yeah, the, look, the Mets got me there twice. The Nets got me there twice. The Jets have never gotten me there. But when a championship is won – I think it'll be that much sweeter. Like, if I saw a championship when I was 13, I don't know if I would have appreciated it as much as I'll appreciate it now when I see it in my 40s or 50s. How do you sleep? Yeah, I know you have two young kids. I was listening the other day. You went on a trip, and when your wife fell asleep, you were listening to stuff on your iPad. And you know, I mean, how do you do that? Do you, do you ever get to the point you get tired at all? Or? I find different ways to sleep, but really, uh, I don't sleep that much, maybe four or five hours a night, but it's the way that I can be a good husband, good father, and a good sports talk host by watching everything. I want to balance those three things, and with the invention of DVR, I've been able to pull it off. How old is your oldest kid now? My oldest is six. My youngest is two. My, my oldest is getting into sports, though. So, he, like, he watched the playoff games with me, the Islanders and the Nets. He's, he's got right. a Met games. He went to 20 Met games with me last year. And I've even kind of gotten him to score games. And I never even asked him to. He saw Dad doing it and said, I want to do that. I want to do that. So, my six-year-old has become like a mini-me. Oh, my one regret in this job, my father died in 1972. So you never saw me get to the whatever MLB. I know it was your father the reason you are became a sports fan. I my father's a diehard giant football fan, baseball fan. He got me into sports. So whatever what I'm doing now is because of him. Same way with your dad. I, oh yeah, my my dad was a diehard Met fan. He had season tickets. He would go to 60, 70 games a year before I was old enough. And then so me and my sister and my mom would go to games as when we were kids. And then I think when I turned around eight or nine, as I started scoring games, I started to get that same bug. So me and him would go to just an absurd amount of games all the time. So he brought me into the Mets, and he was a Jet fan and a Net fan and an Islander fan, but it was the Mets that really got me into sports. And then as I was growing up, those other things 
became much more passionate in my life. But yeah, it was all my dad. He, I blame him for all the Met love. He put it in my brain. Do you remember what your best Met moment so far be in lieu of a world championship? Is there one game where you remember the most? Oh man, it, the Johan no-hitter meant a lot to me because I was always sitting there at every game praying for that no-hitter. So the Johan, and I was in the building. Unfortunately, my dad wasn't, so that kind of sucked. But the Johan no-hitter, the Robin Ventura Grand Slam single was epic. It's just we didn't win the series. So as, as great as it was, I feel bad putting it number one because at the end of the day, game six was brutal. You know, it was just, oh, it still haunts me. Um, and then winning the pennant in 2002. And you know what my favorite one was, actually? If I had to pick one, all right, because I've just given you three. Being in my apartment with my wife and my father watching Jacob DeGrom battle game five against the Dodgers in 15, and then watching Familia get the six outs, and that emotion when he got that last out. I think I was crying. I was so excited. Plus, the game was just so crazy. So I think if I had to pick one, it's probably game five against the Dodgers in 15. How many Met games do you go to a year, Evan? It's still a high number, not as much, just because of the kids and having a wife. Last year, I got to 40, which was a good number. So probably like in the 30s to 40s, in a given year, but back in the day, man, when I lived in Queens and I didn't have kids, I would go to like 65 games a year. Did you ever think you got out of high school when 2001? Did you ever think now you're on SNY TV, you, you started, do you ever think you would get to the point where you are now? I mean, at a relatively young age. I, you know, I, I always had the dream of being on WFAN, but it was simply just get on FAN and do a show. So like, I never even dreamt of replacing Mike and the Mad Dog or replacing Mike. It was simply, I just want to do something I love doing. So when I was doing Middays with Joe, I was content, man. Like, it was, this is my dream job. I've made it. Obviously, there's been other things over the last few years that are awesome. You know, afternoon drive, being on TV. But I think my goal was always just get on the fan, do a show, and have fun. And live a, a fun life. That was it. Tell, tell me about how, Howard Stern, Mr. Evan. <laughs> I mean, I've read your stuff. You read Private Parts? Yes. So I, I, I always I, I love it. I missed your point. I apologize. It's all right. <laughs> I always loved Howard Stern as a kid. So I was saying I was hosting this kind of kids talk show back in the day. Right. And I thought it would be funny, like a bit, to audition for the Howard Stern movie. I'd audition as Howard Stern. So I dressed up as Howard and went on this audition, said a lot of inappropriate things because I was trying to be Howard Stern in fairness. I'm not going to repeat it because it's offensive. But I was being Howard. Right? I put it that way. And they liked me, but they didn't give me the part. They gave me the part of Howard Stern's friend as a kid. So... I didn't really get the part I was going for. I got a different part. And then obviously, if you've seen the movie, I said some horrendous things. But I was just acting. You know, what are you going to do? They, they put lines in front of you. You're supposed how, to how old were you? you know? I was, I think, about 13 years, or 13 or 14 wow. at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And let me go back to the shows you incredibly. Is there a lot of planning that you just play off what happened the night before? Or is a lot of this freelance? You need to decide what you're going to talk about each day or... Or is it just back and forth, it's whatever happens, happens? We, we know going in what we're going to talk about, but everything that happens, like branching out from that, is all just spur of the moment. So you know after you know a big giant loss or a big jet win or Yankees or Mets, okay, we're going to start here, we're going to go there, this is a crazy story that's going to come up. But most of the time when we do a show, things come up that you just can't plan. So I think you have an idea of what you're going to hit, but then the show goes in a million different directions. I mean, who, who, who is your favorite all-time Met? It's DeGrom. Believe it or not, it's, yeah. it's and I know I'm older, so usually it would be somebody when you're younger. But yeah, I, I, I love DeGrom from the beginning because I think his whole Met career has been about disrespect. From his major league debut, ooh, Montero's better, to getting right, no run exactly. support against the Yankees, to Met fans the following year debating if Matt Harvey should start opening day, which pissed me off. It was like, excuse me, it's DeGrom. The guy just won Rookie of the Year. To Noah Syndergaard's the real ace. Like, I always felt there was a debate that never involved DeGrom for five years. Like, everybody was better. And then finally, in 18 and 19, it became undeniable. You couldn't argue anymore. And then even at the end, you know, with Met fans arguing, they shouldn't re-sign him. He's always hurt. He doesn't want to be here. Like, I feel his entire career he's been disrespected by Met fans. And that brought my love for him even further because I think he's one of the great pitchers of all time. It was a joy watching him. And I didn't mind that he was a business-as-usual guy, that he didn't want attention, that he wasn't a media guy. He just wanted to go out and dominate. So I think DeGrom's my number one. Do you remember his uh, walk-up song was I'm a Simple Man? That was him to a T. Well, he was no commercials, no 
you know, no, uh, any, any and the only the guy want to do is, is pitch, you know, yep. day in and day. So I'm, the major is among your teams, who's the first going to win a championship? Uh, I, I have to say the Mets because I trust the owner. I mean, I just trust Steve Cohen a lot more than I trust Woody Johnson, than I trust Joe Sy. Um, I would probably rank it Mets one, Islanders two, Jets three, Nets four. The Nets are never going to win a championship. If they couldn't win with Kevin Durant, James Harden, and Kyrie Irving, they will never win. So I, I have the most confidence in the Mets that they will be the team, and they should be the team because I love all my teams. I'm super passionate, especially about the Jets, Nets, and Mets. But the Mets are my first love. So if any team's going to be that first one, for me at least, it should be the Mets. You know, I used to love everyone. He used to come up to the season ticket holders things. He used to pop up and he asked a question. And you didn't, you didn't hold back. I mean, I remember. <laughs> no, I mean, it was good. I mean, you're very passionate. Do you remember those things? Oh, yes. Said, I remember getting into it with Sandy Alderson because I didn't like he made a joke. And, and funny, the joke turned out to be right. I criticized him for not going after Giancarlo Stanton, and his joke was, who needs Stanton? We have Nimmo. Now, at the time, that seemed like a very offensive joke. I sit here all these years later, Sandy, you were right. You, was, you nailed that one, Sandy. Yeah. yeah. Hey, is your wife a sports fan? Do you have made her a sports fan? She is not a sports fan at all, which I think is perfect. She has roots for the teams for my happiness. She loves going to games now, but not as someone who's – focused on things but I think that's a perfect match I think for somebody as crazy as me it, it actually makes sense to have a wife who's like yeah I'm more into the housewives so when is when is your book gonna come out yeah it's it's gonna be spring of 2024 I didn't realize that writing a book is such a process uh but yeah spring of 2024 it'll come out and I'm picking my 50 greatest some wins some losses it's not all wins met scorecards most memorable okay. scorecards what's your most memorable loss my most memorable loss, boy, it's there's a few that, there's a few that just jump out at yeah. me. Uh, game one of the World Series in 2000, obviously. I was in the building that day at Yankee Stadium, yeah. sitting by myself as a 17 year old. My dad was on the other side of the building. That's how difficult it was to get tickets. Yeah. Um, I think because of my age, I would actually go a year earlier and say Game Six against the Braves in 1999 because we were this close to forcing a Game Seven. We're down early. Al Leiter can't get a freaking out. Piazza yeah, hits that home epic run. home run. Oh, I think the it's probably number one just because that was my first real playoff experience, so it was new to me. So game six ninety nine against the Braves still haunts my nightmares. You know, one of my mine was uh, in the eighty eight playoffs when uh, when when we we were beating the Dodgers forty two in the ninth inning. It was it Socha? Yep, Socha game. Hit, hit the home run and and then. And then and we lost that game. We went, you know, beat the Dodge 10 of 11 games yep. that year, win 100 games and don't do it, you know. But, but uh, hey, I just want to listen. I, I appreciate your time, Evan. It's good to catch up with you. But the next time you're here, I usually come a couple of days during the week. Maybe get a, a couple of say hello or I'd love to be asking the press box. And, you know, best of luck. And tell Craig I said hi. But, I mean, so he's a Yankee, Matt Fitt, Matt Fitt, Yankee, Yankee, Matt Fitt, Matt Fitt. <laughs> Met he's a he's a fraud. That's what he is. He knows wow. it. He's a baseball fan fraud. Well, but I tell you, he knows his stuff too. I've known Craig a long time, you know, going back. But I, I know him as a Met fan. I will always think of him as a Met fan, no matter what he says on the radio. So yeah, he he's, he's sneaky. He knows more than people uh, believe. Like he knows more sports than he lets on. But yeah, I think deep in his soul, he's a Met fan. But just to piss me off, he's become a Yankee fan. Well, listen, I hope I hope you, your dream is true. I hope the Mets are the first to win. Love to get another ring, you know, and my this is my forty fourth opening day here. Wow. So well, probably yeah. I mean I so at April first, nineteen eighty. My first day on the way to Shea Stadium, I got lost. I wound up in Brooklyn. <laughs> so but Scott, you're a good guy. Listen, I appreciate it catching up. I mean good luck with everything you're doing, man. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate it, man.